And we are live on a Friday night with a brand spanking new episode of Star Trek Discovery. The final season is here. We're three episodes in, and I got Dave here to discuss it with me. Yeah, I'm ready to do this thing. I, uh, you know, let's let's go on the treasure hunt, man. And I see there's already some people in the audience, so we're going to go ahead and get the show started. I'm Fathery. This is Dave. And this is Text Trek. Engage. Welcome back aboard the Starship Texas for the 282nd installment of the Text Trek podcast, the home of Star Trek fandom from deep in the heart of Texas, where we take a deep look at Star Trek old and new. And tonight we are talking about Star Trek Discovery Season 5, Episode 3, Janal. Or Janal? Janal? How do you say his name? Janal? Janal. Janal, yeah. Janal. Yeah. Janal, y'all. <laughs> uh, written by Kyle Jaro and Lauren Wilkinson and directed by Andy Armaganian. And uh, this is uh, three of our ten episodes we're getting in the final s- season of Discovery. So we're already 30% complete. If it was a progress bar, it would be uh, three-tenths of the way loaded. So It's a little unnerving, yeah. but, you know, we're on. So we're, it's, it's, we're in it, so no turning back. But there's a lot to talk about in this episode. They they gave us a lot of uh, a lot of substance to chew on this week. Not not like last week when they dumped two episodes on us. And it's like, oh my god, we have so much to cover. So you it, say dumped? They gifted us with two episodes. Gifted, they gifted. gifted. Yeah, so it's like it's a lot of work to do in a short span of time. If you're doing deep dive discussions on these episodes I mean, yes. every week, but, <laughs> but we're here for it. We we answer the uh, the call of duty when we hear it. So. Uh, you know, we're like Rainer. It's like we, you couldn't even make us retire. You know, you couldn't even like force us to not do this job. So, uh, Oh, we can act like Rainer. Oh, okay. That's awesome. <laughs> I didn't say it's always for the best, but... Uh, Father, I did not give you permission to speak freely. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the old white dude is in the room, so... Guy, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's the lesson I'm taking from this. Um, no, uh, yeah, well, we're obviously going to be talking about Rainer today. Um, uh, several characters had kind of you know, rough, rough goes in this episode. He was one got, of them. Got some Rainer stuff. There was even some Savru and Tarina stuff. We got some Adira and Gray stuff. But if, I think the star of the show, Dr. Kolber, we, we'll cover all of that in one moment. Uh, before we get into that, uh, we do need to do some housekeeping. And the most important thing to do is give a huge thank you and shout out to the lovely, lovely, wonderful Text Trek Patreon supporters. So thank you so much, Starfleet So Hell, Cake is Eternal, Crazy Dutchie, Joanne Robertson, John Daw, Geek Filter, Quark Spar, Stephanie Durantas, Matthew Averett, Braxton, Chuck A, Joel Valisok, Benginium, and our anonymous supporters. Uh, we love to have monthly watch parties and hang out with the patrons and celebrate their support every month. And if you're watching us live on Friday, we got a big one happening tomorrow on Saturday, April 13th. We're actually watching Star Trek Three: The Search here. So it is. Uh, also happens to be my favorite Star Trek film. I like I like many a Star Trek film, but that one just happens to be the one I personally like the most. But looking forward to watching that with the patrons. Yeah, that's gonna be super fun. Uh, they're always fun, but like uh, Star Trek Three uh, is iconic, and uh, it's gonna it's gonna pr- prompt some good good talk, I'm sure. You get to see uh, get to see Captain Kirk fight Doc Brown in the form of a Klingon. <laughs> As a planet falls apart, the the apocalypse of a planet uh, is is the is the set piece that these two combatants fight on top of. So, quite the, the spectacle. One of the great scenes in it when the you know my God bones, what have I done? It's it's it's, it's such a good scene. 
And uh, we'll have some other watch party fun in May. We actually have a lot going on. So there's some bridge crew level patrons with birthdays. So there's going to be multiple watch parties. We're going to get that figured out this next week. And uh, we'll have some more announcements on uh, next week's show about things happening in May. Um, but there's also a little bit of a... Uh, of Star Trek franchise new news overall. So um, I guess uh, a good news, bad news situation today on day of recording. Uh, let, let's do the bad news first. Sure. But we found out that Star Trek Discovery is not the only uh, season five of Star Trek that will be ending a show in 2024 in a few months. We don't know any, the exact date, but this fall, Star Trek Lower Decks will premiere its fifth and final season. Uh, Mike McMahon and Alex Kurtzman did a uh, little thank you announcement message that they sent out today. Um, but, you know, I've already heard rumblings of, uh, well, you know, who knows? There could be possible more Lower Decks in the future. You know, I, I was uh, talking to some people earlier today and I said, you know, well, as long as Titmouse saves all those animation files and, you know, these, these voice actors can get near some microphones and record some lines, there's no reason why we can't have a Lower Decks reunion, you know, at any point in the future, you know. there A lot of the uh, Adult Swim animated shows that used to be on, like, Adult Swim, like, 20 years ago, and they get canceled, mm -hmm. they just, like, a lot of them get, like, uh, revivals within, like, the last few years, so I think it's I think it's uh, very likely that we'll see more of them, but, um, yeah, that, that was kind of sad to see. It is, but, you know, it's like, they, they got five seasons out uh, in much less time, I guess, than Discovery. <laughs> Did, uh... It's almost like old school television. It's like, yeah, we, we're going to premiere a new season uh, every every year in the fall. You know, it's only ten episodes, but still, it's like at least we can be like you know consistent like clockwork. So, Jill asks a uh, hard uh, Sophie's Choice question in the audience. She says, "If you had to pick one to be renewed, Lower Decks or Strange New Worlds? Which Strange would you New pick? Worlds. Strange New Worlds. She is torn. I'm with you. I'd pick Strange New Worlds. You know, I never fell into it. I'd Strange New Worlds, see... I think, is the, the most important thing in the franchise right now. So, Well, there's, there's you know, there's most important and there's bad or your favorite <laughs> or what you like, enjoy the most, too. Um, so, um, but yeah, even me, yeah, as, as everybody knows, I think I'm not, the, not a follower of it. I just didn't plug into its kind of rapid fire humor style, uh, except occasionally. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's <laughs> obviously beloved. And honestly, that's what gives me some hope that, uh, this may not, this may not be the end for it is just the sheer strength of the fandom. Yeah. I mean, uh, just last year, you know, we were watching Star Trek that had, uh, Riker and Tuvok and Ensign Roe. Right. I guess not an Ensign anymore, but you know, I, so, you know, I, I think we've not seen the, the last of. Rutherford and Tindy and Mariner in, in whatever shape or form. Uh, I see Jill in the chat is asking if uh, can we get Netflix to save it. And and who knows? That might be something that we see uh, we see more of is Star Trek pimped out to other streaming services outside of Paramount. Just to, I guess to talk about that for a little bit, I, I kind of segued into that. I wanted to get into like, the good news, but I guess I'll, I'll save that with Strange New Worlds. But the Skydance deal of, of Skydance purchasing the controlling ownership of Paramount Global, mm -hmm. that seems to be moving forward, although there is, like, some resistance now with, uh, you know, it's going to be, like, a really good deal for Sherry Redstone, who basically is like, here, I have, like, control of this company. I'm going to sell it to the Skydance guy and let him just run it. Um, so he wants to combine it with his company, which would increase the value of Paramount Global, and that would, like, decrease the shareholder value for everyone else other than Sherry Redstone, who doesn't own the majority ownership, but it has like some stakes in it. So I know this is probably getting like boring with like the business jargon, but, but basically there, there's some investors that are like, they don't want that deal, but Sherry Redstone's still pushing for it. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But I think what might be a result from that is they're talking, Skydance is talking about how like they want to keep Paramount Plus. They want it there. They don't want to get rid of it. They want to uh, supercharge it. They want to like, upgrade the tech and merge it with another streaming service. So either Peacock or Max or Amazon Prime. I think Peacock's the most likely of all of those. But uh, that would kind of work out well for the consumer in that they're not merging companies. They're just merging the streaming platform. So it's not going to be like a ton of, of layoffs uh, of, you know, companies merging and stuff. But, and it would just be one less streaming platform. If you have Peacock and Paramount Plus or just one or the other, it'd be like, well, we're just going to put both of those together into one package. So... 
probably probably going to hike up the price. But I think that's where we're going with these streaming platforms. In, in a few years, there's only going to be like four streaming platforms, and they're all going to cost like twenty five dollars a month. Yeah, that seems to be the uh, general shape of things. Uh, which you know, twenty five is obnoxious, but if 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 you're getting more services for it. Maybe maybe that's where we're gonna tumble out. Yeah, or sign up for all four of them for like a hundred dollars a month, and it would still be cheaper than. I think a lot of people today think you can get cable for less than a hundred dollars a month because they they cut the cord so long ago they don't realize how expensive cable is. But uh, I I think uh, I think cable would still be the more expensive option. But uh, anywho, but there was good news as well. Star Trek Strange New Worlds has been confirmed for a season four. So, and I have not really like looked at this at all. So they might've already, they, I doubt they would have said much about production. Uh, they might just start shooting like pretty quickly after they wrap season three. I know season three was delayed because of these strikes. And sometimes right. they do that. They shot seasons four and five of disco back to back. Uh, you know, four was delayed because of COVID. So I think that they're going to pick up production on Strange New Worlds pretty soon. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was talking about, like, oh, maybe they'll keep Lower Decks around and we can have, like, you know, live action Trek in the spring and then animated Lower Decks in the fall. And they can just, like, alternate the Academy one year and Strange New Worlds another year. But it looks like uh, Lower Decks will go away after this year. So I don't know if they'll want to uh, maybe pursue another animated Star Trek show or if they're going to have clear room to do more of Alex Kurtzman's made for streaming movies, you know, after mm. Section 31. Hey, they, they want to not only do a Section 31 sequel, bring back Michelle Yeoh for a sequel to that, but they want to do uh, other, other spinoffs. They, they, they want to do a Picard follow-up, you know, something with Captain Seven on the Enterprise G. I would, I would love to watch that made for streaming movie. So, you know, the, um, just, just the sense of having gotten two animated things back to back makes me think they'll back off of it a little bit uh, with with uh, Lower Decks and Prodigy, but yeah. that's just kind of an instinct. I, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I guess neither of them were what you call massive hits for them. They did well, right? They've done well for streaming, but you know, I guess the yeah, five seasons why, is good. Um, why they but, I mean, issues? We don't, we don't know what the what the i guess actual numbers are but yeah i mean uh five seasons is really good for lower decks so i think it i would color that uh pretty successful i think just the shows don't have a ton of when you keep investing money in on past five seasons it's like why it's already you know this is already like a big thing to like sell to a streaming service you know there there's five seasons to plug in so why am i going to keep investing money in it now um, right you know, as, as soon as they hit, like, those magic numbers, you know, in the old days, it was, like, around 100 episodes. When you get, like, around 100 episodes, that's why Enterprise lasted four seasons and then st and then was canceled because the studio was like, oh, look, we have 100 episodes. We can sell this to cable channels or whatever, and, you know, they can, they can put it on syndication or we can sell it to, you know, little network affiliates to, you know, show, uh, you know, whatever, whenever they have, like, bl blank slots in their scheduling and um, – I guess now the magic number is only like three or five seasons to before you get canceled. But uh, yeah, there there really is like a trend these days of just like a lot of showrunners like not knowing if they're gonna, if their show will end or not, and that's, sometimes that's it does. Rough. Yeah, that's kind of brutal. Yeah, before they before they can uh, wrap up or finish or whatever. So it's like a little chaotic. But it, we had like the good news with Strange New Worlds. So. Um, and I guess we also learned from BBC that uh, Scotty is going to be a regular in Strange New Worlds. So. Yeah, that, that sounds good to me. I think I probably assumed that would be the case. Yeah. But, um... uh, well, you know, as they kind of trans, they they cast such a young dude for Scotty. It's just hard to imagine mm -hmm. how in in you know six he years he's gonna he's gonna be James Duhon. But uh, yeah, I mean that's true. But you know, I guess that's that's just sort of casting. You know wankery <laughs> but he, he seems like a little wet behind the ear so not just in, you know in terms of appearance like looking too youthful but he, he's gonna have to like grow as a character i think well father the enterprise ages you <laughs> it's, it's it's a tough it's a it's it's a harsh oh, God, violation burning the candle at both ends reading those technical manuals i guess oh yeah uh 
Oh, there is a, another big piece of news that I don't think anyone else talked about, but only, I'm, I seem to be the only person excited about this movie ever. And I know y'all are like, oh, a Star Trek movie, like a theatrical movie, like those never happen anymore. But I, this is the one that I told y'all, like, pay attention to. But the untitled Star Trek origin story is what they're calling it now. But they added that to their slate at uh, Cinem- CinemaCon or what, CineCon or whatever they call that mm-hmm. uh, event they just did in Vegas. But uh, they, they said that the movie is on their slate for 2025. They're, they're saying this movie will come out next year. I think it's actually going to get pushed back to 2026 for the 60th anniversary. I think they're going to want to have something then on the 60th. But they want to start shooting by the end of this year. And, and they have Toby Haynes set to direct. And they have that uh, Seth Graham Smith writer dude who wrote uh, the Lego Batman movie. And uh, he, he did like the Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter and uh, some other stuff that I'm not – I can't think of off the top of my head. But – uh, I want that Andor guy directing, a, you know, the Black Mirror Star Trek episode guy. I want Toby Haynes directing a Star Trek movie. And I think yeah. this is kind of like what they're describing as like an origin set decades before Star Trek 09. I think this will deal with uh, Romulan War or Formation of Federation or both. I think it'll be just set, you know, kind of a, a, a decade or less after Star Trek Enterprise. Um and it, I think they'll kind of use it as this can be like a prequel for more Kelvin movies or more prime timeline movies. They're going to use this as like this is before the divergence point. So this is a, this is going to be a prequel to like everything, anything we're doing now going forward. But uh, it's weird because we don't have like a ship or a crew to hang the story on yet. Right. Right. That's why I think this one's going to happen because they're not dealing with all the headaches of trying to get all those Kelvin actors <laughs> together. Right. Right. It's a bunch of young ensigns. <laughs> that look a lot like unpaid interns. <laughs> yeah, it'll definitely be the cheaper cast. So I think that's a big reason why the, uh, the the wheels are moving a lot faster on this movie than the, the fourth Kelvin film. I feel like I'm always open if they've got a story to what they've got to say, but I can't say that era in particular has like a lot of interest. I feel like Enterprise hit a lot of the major beats of like, you know, the origin of the Federation and everything. I, I don't think it, I but as far as like the actual like, no, I, 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 think, I think Enterprise stopped before it, it could... Um, I mean, there, there were plans. Enterprise had plans to cover things like the Romulan War and, right, right. Um, and the, the, the Federation formation. So um, I, I, I think, there's, I think that's actually a pretty fertile ground. People have been talking about making movies there since like 2005 when Enterprise got canceled. But I don't want to go... they to hide the Romulans the whole time. They can't show their faces. But that would, they just—they can show them to the audience. They just can't sh- show them to the enemy or to the. That is, that is going to be humans. a weird bit of hands tying. I don't think that. I just put helmets on them, Rob. We know Romulans wore helmets. That's all you got to do. Like most most battles are fought with like ships. Like they they already explained all that. Like it's already. I, I know, know. I'm just saying, like if it's a major point and they're like interacting much with the with Starfleet peoples, I, I feel like it's going to be restrictive. Okay. But you know. I'm open to people. Dave, uh, I, I Dave thinks the Toby Haynes Star Trek prequel is, is not going to be any good because he doesn't want Romulans in it, I think. Uh, I don't know that that's the case, but <laughs> I, I'm always willing to trust writers if they've got a story to tell. Well, uh, let's talk about this story of Janal. So um, the official synopsis reads, On Trill... Captain Burnham, Book, and Colber must pass a dangerous test to prove themselves worthy of the next clue. Adira reconnects with Gray and Saru's first day as ambassador is complicated by his engagement to Tarina. Uh, but yes, on Trill, they are able to get the next clue. They now know what sector of space they need to go to to, uh, I guess, find the progenitor tech, or at least find the, the next clue to it next yeah. map fragment it was yeah. it was a little unclear on that but uh, i found that like any movie including even like favorites like oh Riggs lost ark or something um if you if you poke too much at the kind of structure you know the whys and wherefores they're looking for here or there they, they usually tend to fall apart a bit and so to some degree you almost have to take a little on faith that this structure is just a fun one and they're gonna bend and credulity a little bit uh, but yeah sometimes i'm a little wait why why are they doing that now but they did touch on this a little bit more and I'm, we'll get to it i'm sure when we're talking about um uh the, the the 
what Janal says about, you know, why they structured it this way later on. And uh, Adira and Grey break up, and Saru, right. uh, Saru learns how to balance, I guess, work with your partner and uh, I guess the, the drama that goes with uh, Vulcan politics. But that yeah, was yeah, that too. was interesting. Um, well, uh, Dave, why don't you give us the, uh, the first opening statement and just kind of let us know your broad impressions on the episode. Sure. Um, I, um, you know, t- for me, this was, this was Wilson Cruz's episode uh, and I was pretty, pretty all in for it. I, I think it's interesting how often Star Trek kind of creates science fiction scenarios where actors, you know, get possessed by somebody, inhabit another body, something notable changes in them, Spock becomes unvulcanized, uh, you know, mind swaps, all of these, and all they're all op- opportunities for the actors to really stretch their legs, try something different, um, and... I, I really enjoyed Cruz getting to stretch his legs uh, with Janal inhabiting him. Um, I, I liked seeing him living it up, but it, he also still had that um, Colbert-type sincerity. So, you know, we were talking about when he says, oh yeah, these clues that we're giving are, are their tests. We need to make sure people are worthy of this information. And I, like, I honestly think that's a kind of a dumb plot point. Like, there'd be there has to be better ways than making people go through an obstacle course. But because uh, Cruz had, could also bring that sort of Culper-like sincerity to the moment, uh, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I took it, uh, I, I believed it. You know, I can, it's a plot point I can work with. Um, and, and, you know, I still, I'm still liking the treasure hunt structure because, uh, because that's a trope that I kind of like. And... They're also subverting it. We talked about this in, in the last one. They continue to do it. Um, in the, uh, I, I'm trying to remember, in episode one, you know, they made a point to, Indiana Jones goes through these marketplaces and towns all the time and chaos and, you know, chases through them, smashing shit. But they saved the village in the first one. There was a, you know, there was a, that was it, a, uh, not an earthquake, it was a avalanche. Um, and they saved him from that. Uh, there was a stone artifact in episode two that could have been destroyed in the process of them figuring out its secrets, but they made a point to preserve it. It's a big thing. And so now we get to episode three, and there's a big monster that they have to fight to get to where they need to get. And instead of finding it, they realize that it's not their place to uh, encroach on its habitat and that they need to back off and find another way, and that's the answer. So uh, I actually really like this this kind of structure of subverting uh, pulp adventure expectations while still engaging with them in a, in a lot of ways. Um, it feels consistent with uh, Starfleet's ideals, with Trek philosophy. Um, uh, beyond that, I liked some of the very intentional, awkward moments of the episode, the kind of sad evolution of Adira and Gray's relationship, uh, Saru misstepping with Tarina and getting a little manipulated by her uh, I guess that guy's an advisor um, and uh, and Commander Rayner arguably not understanding the assignment uh, <laughs> that uh, Burnham gave him uh, but I, I enjoyed all of those things I don't think I really had any serious criticisms you know other than uh, yeah the um, treasure hunt structure is has, can have some screwy plot points sometimes to move it forward uh, and I, I like it. I like a cool little ending. I like Maul's little sneaky tracker sequence in the in the caves. So yeah, it was a it was a win for me. Uh, Dave, you you talked a, a lot about the treasure hunt stories, kind of having dumb contrivances before. Um, yep. And I I don't know. I I kind of like brushed that off as like yeah, but you know, just all action adventure storytelling. You know, anything will have like those convenient tropes to lean on, but. Uh, as I was watching this week's episode, I was like, oh yeah, Dave is right. Like these stories really do have a lot of like dumb stuff, but uh, I think it's really clever how Discovery is finding a ways of explaining so much of that, uh, in, in these first three episodes. So they, they, they kind of impressed me. I'm think, I think, oh wow, they're, they're leading up to something kind of dumb, but then I'll get like a line of dialogue where I'm like, that makes it go down so much easier. You know, it's like a, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down t- uh, kind of thing. But uh, the, the 
only like real concerning thing in this episode that stood out to me, and it's not honestly like that concerning, but just the the spiritual slant they're putting on on the arc. I I mm. think uh, it was a. Uh, that just that kind of kind of hit me out of left field, and I'm I'm not sure how I'll I'll feel about that it, can, based on what they do going forward. Uh, so I'll just have to kind of wait and see. Uh, but uh, I love the point of the episode that they kind of sum up with Gray's monologue at the end. But uh, I kind of like that it, you know it was an episode actually about something, and uh, they they do kind of spoon feed you the message, but uh, they they pretty much just tell you, yeah, life is a journey, and you know there's gonna be some discovery at the end. You know we're we're all trying to find like that discovery, whatever it is. But as you're on this journey, you're gonna have opportunities to connect with other people, and you'll connect with them based on if you choose to connect with them, or if you choose not to, and if you put in the work, and if you if you don't put in the work, and you you will have to evaluate what connections will I have. What connections will I not have? When do I sever a connection? When do I change a connection? So uh, it was uh, an episode uh, about, I guess, connecting. So it's something that Discovery tends to, uh, to focus on a lot, I've, I've noticed over the years. But um, we can go ahead and get into the, the episode breakdown, starting off at the beginning. There's some stuff at Starfleet HQ before they make the uh, the jump to Trill and kind of setting up what's what's going on with Burnham bringing on Rainer and also going on this mission to uh, compete with Maul and Locke. And there's some, there's a lot of uh, Maul talk at the beginning. And we, we get, we get some, a uh, little bit of backstory. Yeah. They managed to dig some stuff up on her, uh, no doubt with uh, the basically books information as the starting point. I, you'd think they would have like basically everybody's history in, in this far flung future. But I figure after the burn and a you know bad emerald chain rule and all that stuff that that maybe data is a little dodgy. Or there's just better privacy standards and the state doesn't keep uh, as much uh, documented be, on on individuals. You know, given the fact that there could be mysteries on the Enterprise and other than or Enterprise any given starship, and yes, you can ask where somebody is. But other than that, they don't seem. It seems like they don't always make a point that there's even cameras everywhere, uh, unless they do need them to be there. Uh, but yeah, it, it feels like that maybe that privacy has made a comeback. And we learn that we're we're looking for an individual trill. We get this this guy uh, Janal. They they found that the markings left on the map piece we got in the last episode actually match a. We were just talking about like there being records on people. I guess you know they keep people's fingerprints on file. They keep people's uh, trill spots on file. So. We learned that well, uh, Sari fair, and dorsal ridges are unique also. So Linus has a very unique ridge. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I heard them mention that. Um, uh, you know, I guess this was... Um, oh, wait, it, it was... No, it was from somebody who got a symbiont 800 years ago, right? So so in, less, in perhaps less private days... Uh, they just had to find out who was the current person, right? Uh, who was the current host? Right. The the trill dots matched Janal Bix, who was the the trill who was involved with the progenitor tech in the post the chase. So Salon Trek in the comment says a cab includes trill spot registry. <laughs> Is that the? I, I can get behind that. Is that the same as the trill security that they say at the end? Like, oh, the trill security can we, they handle their own? But I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> Maybe they're uh, maybe they're uh, a bit better uh, than our than our Earth security forces that could be a bit Cardassian, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, Dave, you said Rainer maybe didn't understand the assignment, but uh, we have uh, this is his first day as first officer on Disco, also. So yeah, I, li I liked his awkward introduction with um, uh, uh, Michael and her. <laughs> I liked I liked watching her very expressive face as she's trying to handle is this a joke or is he fucking with me kind of you know <laughs> uh it's um it's, you know very good work from sonequa martin green uh, as always but um th watching them they're an unusual pairing um and i you know yeah. it's not just that you know kind of i mean there's there's the, there's an age gap there's a philosophy gap um, and the, the age gap is intentional. He's supposed to be oh, he's the boomer who needs to retire, and then she's right. like the young millennial who's trying to like take over. And right. it, it's, 
I guess that's the you, you, uh, father. Is he going to ask? Is he going to say what this crew needs is to cut down on the avocado toast? <laughs> probably. Uh, and I don't think they're gonna, they're not going to be that ham fisted nah, with it. But nah. that, that's totally what they're going for. It was interesting, you know. They 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 will get to this when we get to it. But he's we see later on that they're a little bit more of the rhyme and reason for why he did things, how he had his shorthand with his previous crew. Uh, he's a guy who doesn't like to like talk about his process though uh he doesn't want to explain himself yeah when he was in front of the tribunal kind of thing he did he real revealed he was worried about like losing that village to the big um avalanche but he, he it wasn't something he was comfortable talking about and he also thought they were you know they'd already made their mind up um <laughs> salon trek says no one wants to take orders anymore <laughs> in the audience uh, when, when like we it. when we get to trill there's some fun stuff with reno and stamets and adira i i really love the stamets and reno scenes i like their i like their friendship I, I loved how like they didn't really get along and i don't know they they, they still like kind of bump up against each other a lot but the, and then reno's real. Reno's uh, sounding like a uh, a woo woo asshole, but <laughs> that what she's talking about, you know that, that that's life, though. You know, we come together, we we drift together, we drift apart. You know, you make connections, you lose connections. She's basically like, yeah, the the whole episode is about this this woo woo shit. You know, you have Janal sure. Janal Bix came across this thing in the twenty fourth century, and then at the end of their existence in the thirty second century, it, it comes into play. But they make like new connections with new people they meet, and then. And the journey passes on to the other people. And I don't know. It's like multiple journeys converging at multiple points. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, I, I thought it was funny because I guess it's just um, uh, Jet Reno, just, she's not a very sentimental person. <laughs> and so she realized she was being a little sentimental and like yeah. tried to check herself. Even like, though, I got embarrassed, got embarrassed. Yeah, about absolutely. It. But it is interesting because uh, Stamets still seems to be kind of... He seems distracted. And I don't know if it's plot point distracted. You know, the legacy stuff he was talking about. He did... He absolutely did I think mention, that's part of it. And and also, like, he was working on the on the Romulan tricorder that came up later uh, in the episode true. when he made his yeah, discovery. A little, little distracting, a little difficult. But yeah, later on, he's going to talk to uh, Commander Rayner and say, hey, this discovery could actually make the spore drive look like nothing. And we know he's thinking about legacy right now, but that has led him to not be paying the closest of attention to his, uh, you know, essentially his, his kid, adopted yeah. kid. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I like seeing that. Like, this was the first Jet Reno we've seen in this season. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. We still, so we have not gotten very much Reno in the final season. I guess it was just this one scene. But I, I think there's more Reno. They, they like to save her for the back half of the seasons <laughs> based on season four. Yeah, look, looking forward to uh, seeing seeing her. Uh, I honestly, because I feel like she's going to be the one who's going to kind of cut through the bullshit or something on some kind of weird puzzle or just the, the weird nature of the treasure hunt style. Uh, she's just going to at some point be like, this is stupid. <laughs> I'm, I'm like looking forward to her deflating it. <laughs> Uh, did you look forward to seeing uh, Guardian Z again? Yeah, I, I I figured we would run into him going back to to Trill. I don't have strong opinions on on Guardian Z. <laughs> he's um, just kind somebody's... of there to be the uh, he's just there to be like the familiar face that the audience knows yeah. and, and trusts. And the, if 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 he says it, well, the audience will believe it, not question it too much because it's like, oh, he's an a... established good guy. Perfectly good role for yeah. a small character to, to be in. He, you know, they don't all have to be, have their own arc and stuff. Somebody yeah, I don't said, need his biography. He's, he's a, a weird monk dude. He like he's he's nice, but he lives in the caves with a bunch of worms. <laughs> Joel in the comments says, "No talk, only riddle," <laughs> <laughs> which which is absolutely uh, yes. That that is his role to be like. I don't even know what I just said. Apparently, you have to answer this riddle. I guess maybe he's like the uh, Jet Reno. He's like, I don't. I didn't know that I was in a National Treasure movie. Um, yeah, here's he's the, like, oh, here's we're the doing riddle, this today. I guess. When they get beamed down to the the caves, though, this is uh, what this is the third time we've seen the caves of Makala. We saw it in, in Disco in season three. We saw it in DS Nine. But this is the first time we've seen it with the AR wall. It's the best it's ever looked. You 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 get like the sense like you're in like a massive cavern and yeah. not a set. Yeah, it's cool. I you know um, 
Every once in a while, I'm kind of aware of the AR wall, but most of the time, I am just a. I, I just kind of let myself get swept along by these things, and I, and I'm just enjoying it and feeling like, oh wow, that's pretty yeah. good looking. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't even think about it the first time I watched the episode. I was just like, oh, the cave sure looks really good. And then I was thinking like, oh, it's never looked this good before. And then when I watched the second episode, I was like, oh, well, clearly, you know, the AR wall makes all the difference. The the, uh, the cave is, in fact, my my background for uh, tonight's live stream. So um, although later on in this later on in the episode, uh, I believe Dave is actually uh, training to become a guardian much like gray yeah so. yeah well i'm trying on the red robes and stuff uh somebody in the comments earlier said it looked like their sleeveless outfits looked like they'd be chilly in those caves uh maybe that's part Probably. of like the monastic focus that you got to have you got to deal with a little chilly damp cave air yeah. or maybe it's like 32nd century fabric and it just keeps you at like whatever your preferred temperature is all day <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, I, I I think feel like the Trill are probably pretty compassionate about their their priests. They probably uh, they probably make you know they probably keep it warm. I liked the character they created with with Bix. I thought it was like a good use of Trill lore. Uh, you know, the idea of like oh this this individual that existed in the twenty fourth century. I get the impression that they weren't even joined. That the only reason why the the, the very the very first one ever joined that why Janal joined with Bix originally was to pass on that important information and to be like, okay, I'm going to keep the secret and not disclose it to anyone. And you're stuck with me. And, and this trill slug ha is just barely holding on passed from host to host. You know, it's mm -hmm. odd for them to, to live uh, 600, 800 years. They, they said in DS nine, they typically only, only live um, like 500 or 600 yeah. And you, but you know, thirty second century maybe life life expectancy has has gone up, and this was a bit even by thirty second century standards. They said this is this is kind of odd, you know, not not impossible, but kind of odd for one to live this long. But I thought it was like a, a cool use of of trill. Like what 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 cool trill shit can you do? And I guess that's part, you know these these lifetimes that can be that that can be preserved like that, kind of a little time capsule of a of a person, you, and then you wake up and you're in Wilson Cruz's body. <laughs> yes. Leading to probably the funniest line of the episode, the, uh, oh, this guy works out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, but I also appreciated the kind of, I suppose, clock in a way, because we did know that this is, this woman is old, the symbiont is old, they're both tired, they both seem to be ready to move on to their next journey in life and, and to pass on. Um, and so they, they, they've got, uh, they don't have a ton of time, although... Once the um, once the symbiont is uh, or the wait not the symbiont original host yeah you know, because the Janal, way that yeah. the way that that ritual works the uh, Ziantara what, what right. which we've seen in Discovery before but you can take a previous host's memories and put it in a different person different individual right um, but yeah uh, that said for somebody who was uh, like ailing. I guess they they got their one last lease on life. They yeah. did get a day to basically go to the park and meet some interesting people, maybe potentially get eaten by a monster, <laughs> and uh, teach a lesson. <laughs> uh, you know what it reminded me of, Dave? The original series episode, is it Return to Tomorrow? I'll get the Tomorrow ones mixed up. Cause mm. you, but the the one with the spheres, and they have to, you know, the Risk is Our Business speech episode. Right, right. Uh, but do you remember when Kirk first gets possessed and, and he's just like so ecstatic to be in a body again and he's just like lungs feeling, feeling with, with air and, and yeah. he's just like, like veins pumping with blood and he's like all excited to be corporeal again and be in a body. And it felt a lot like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good connection. I like that. And you got to think that Janal's thinking like, yeah, hopefully like this is it. Hopefully these are the real deal and I can pass out. I can hand them this little map piece thing and they don't get ate by these monsters. And they, they anything that like I need them to prove to me, they prove to me. And then I can, I can die and, and go off and, and, and be done with my mission that's lasted centuries. But yeah, if it hadn't worked out, he'd be like, okay, I'm going to go back to bed now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess there's probably a reason to hope though, because like kind of a, if they've come this far, they've got a, they've got some potential. 
Um, just uh, real quick, uh, before we get out of the caves and talk about uh, what happens in the, the rock quarry that they love to shoot at in Star Trek Discovery, uh, let's talk about the Adira and Gray stuff, their their breakup. I, I am under the impression that relationship has ended. They, they've they decided to uh, just be friends. And yeah, this, we talked this... a little bit about this um, before... Uh or in the first episode or maybe beforehand. Yeah, I said I wanted uh, a, ha- a happily ever after for for some for some romantic pair. Uh, we were thinking it probably wouldn't be these two just because of how young they are. Right, right. And then the what, what we got is, you know, potentially happy in the long term, it was yeah. uh, but was certainly sad in the moment. You know, um even though they both were kind of finding that, oh, basically they were kind of into their careers right now, is I guess what I would say, and discovering <laughs> what they could do on their own uh, and, and not as part of their, very, you know, almost, you know, spiritual, m- magical connection they had before. But it did feel to me that, like, Adira was not quite as ready for this step as Grey was. Yeah. And the way that they were written previously, Grey has always felt a little mature and possibly older than mm, adira yeah, i think yeah. if if they're not the exact same age you know even if they are i think gray at, at least had probably more dating experience than adira before they they got together that's yeah, even that's, that's it's even fits. gray gray who says maybe maybe we need to change the way we're doing things you know there's different kinds of relationships which i thought was kind of interesting i thought like oh are they talking about like maybe we should try an open relationship or something else i kind of like i'm glad that the episode didn't try to spend like a lot of time on that but i I like just putting that idea out there in the universe and and kind of normalizing that the same as like making this a very i think a kind of healthy breakup like i don't see i don't see a lot of tv shows of like uh teenagers or, or people that are just like barely above teenagers uh, you know, like breaking up and it being kind of a uh, uh, healthy and and good <laughs> like this. Yeah, yeah, it was it was uh, it was it was good, but like still had the sadness. I think it it needed to have. Um, I guess when Gray says, you know, are we breaking up? And Adira has to be the one to say say yes. Uh, the look on their face, that kind of I'm not quite. I'm, I'm going to struggle with saying it. You know, like. Mm. But was I thought some really nice acting. You know, I wanted to compliment Blue to Barrio on that um, uh, because that was pretty rough. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I felt for him. It's 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 tough to you know be the, the that partner that's the the one who's maybe wanting it a little bit more and and is a little bit less able. But uh, I was also was able to advocate for themselves and say this is the relationship I kind of need. And, and if it can't be what we had, then it does need to end. And so I appreciate it. That's some maturity. Uh, like you said, um, you know, difficult, but, but, but a mature decision. Uh, one of the things I did not want to see in the final season of discovery was any backpedaling from the uh, representation discovery has, has been really pushing in recent years. Yeah. And so it was important to me that we did pick up on the Gray Adira relationship, and we did see Gray again. I don't know if if I'm like totally satisfied on you know Discovery continuing to because I think it is you know kind of groundbreaking to just just have characters that are non-binary or trans is still super rare in television. You know there aren't there aren't too many TV shows other than Star Trek Discovery doing it, and it seems like there's even fewer now than there was say two or three years ago. Mm. So I'm I'm hoping that uh, Adira still has some some more stuff and 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 I, honestly like more substance like okay this was it was kind of okay to see this but I mean like it doesn't doesn't really like add a ton of substance to the show I want Adira to have something more important to do later in the season I think right now what they've been doing with Adira is Adira is part of Team Tilly and Adira yeah uh, which I like them I think they're a cool pairing together. Yeah. You know, because that was, you know, we had Tilly and Stamets in early seasons. Right, but right. We, we did talk about, there's a lot of science people on board the ship right now. And there is kind of a question of like, oh, you know, what what kind of sets, uh, well, any of them apart. Arguably, Stamets, now that he's not doing the spore drive, not so special. Tilly is kind of a guest starring science person uh, who's off doing Starfleet Academy stuff. And, and so I, I, it would probably help be good for the show to in some ways show that with like their specialties, you know, something that is kind of only they yeah. each one can do. Let's give Adira a specialty. Let's give Adira something no one else can do. I mean, they kind of have that with their because they have all the the trill memories, you know. So they they 
you, they can kind of do the Jadzia thing and just you know pull yeah. stuff out of the, out of their ass when they need that to. That would be but... cool. I, I want to I want to see more I want to see more Adira. Let's uh, let, let's give Adira something like really big on the 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 end of the show to to, to go out on. I think. I see in the comments that Joanne Robertson was not uh, wild about it. Said they just wanted to end the storyline, no emotional impact. Um, you know, uh, I I, di I disagree. I think it was I think there was uh, an impact, but I'll be curious to see how people how this tumbles out for people. A deer, or sorry, Gray didn't have a ton to do in the previous season, uh, but was what very noble yeah, they, and sort of he, the he got a body and then he's like, okay, I'm I'm leaving. I I got my body well, and I'm gonna leave the the ship. There was some Bye. big stuff with Zora. Z the, the Zora thing I think was big. That was that was season four, right? Kind of yeah. helping Zora through. Oh yeah, yeah. Gray had that that whole arc with Zora. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like like really key stuff for Zora, and you could argue that makes made gray you know uh kind of a sub entity here like a uh an appendage to zora's story but it was you know gray was getting to do lots of stuff was doing the game to help zora kind of focus by not focusing and, and stuff like that so but it was kind of just those scenes and 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 discovery has a pretty big cast so um you know i can understand that you know not everybody can stick around well, let's talk about the the rock quarry. I don't know if this is the last time we see it. There, there, there's still seven more episodes, so we might get back out here. You know, the the, the, the Toronto crew doesn't stay away for too long. Uh, <laughs> they they like to shoot here, but uh, this was probably the the weakest part of the episode for me. Just I thought like the monsters are just kind of I don't know generic. Just like okay, you're running from like an invisible CGI monster. It's uh, not that neat of a design. You're just kind of clear cgi uh but uh, i don't know what, what what did you think of the of the trials that they face with the monsters you know i think i liked all whenever wilson cruz was on screen i thought they were there was some some really good energy to those scenes um book and uh, uh michael they they haven't we don't get know where they're gonna tumble out and they don't know where they're gonna tumble out so they're just kind of being professionals right now the one thing that I kind of thought about this scene, and I think about it, I thought about it in this uh, the scene with Saru and Michael uh, in the jungle in the previous episode, is that they're a little casual, like they're kind of out for an afternoon stroll during what I think needs to have some more energetic oomph sometimes. A little bit of that J.J. Uh, Abrams running down the hallway mm. shit from the early Kelvin movies. I kind of liked his, like nonchalant attitude though because you could you could see like sonequa martin green getting impatient so i thought that was kind of entertaining yeah i i, I guess i just like uh you don't call, like again uh wilson cruz was always uh killing it in this episode <laughs> but um but yeah like they're just like uh, you know i don't need to see them literally running but that's a pretty leisurely walk <laughs> and like you can kind of put some energy into that uh if you if you're trying to get somewhere and the monster when it shows up I, I think it's one of those things it was like it's fine it's you know i i could sort of tell that they wanted to do something else with it than just have them fight the monster mm -hmm. or they would have gone but, into more of like a you know boss fight kind of thing you know go for the weak spots on its shoulders you know or something like that it's like, of like like how you said drones were boring to you in episode two yeah. and like they like to me the, this is more boring like a big cgi animal that wants to eat you um, I guess I, I pick animals slightly <laughs> over drones, but, uh, but yeah, they probably could both use some, some more energy. Well, but here's a question, Father, like, was, I guess it was a faster scene. Like, was the Rancor especially interesting in Return yeah, of the Yeah, that was a cool design. It was an interesting, it had, it had a lot more personality and character. I mean, it was just like kind of a rampaging thing. It just growled and drooled. It, it didn't do much. Um, but I think it was, it was, that was a straight action scene. A, it is lunging for you. If it catches you, it's going to eat you. And, you know, Luke had to just like real quick figure out a way to deal with it. So it's really like a shorter scene. And this was a, they still had to figure out the clue, but I didn't really feel like a high sense of threat to them. You know, the, the, the stinger that went into him, they kind of took that surprisingly in stride, even though it was supposed to be painful, and they're when they're hiding behind the rocks, talking, and and Burnham is like, "Well, let me go out and just kind of like not be a threat." And I was like, "I don't, I don't know." Like, there's a lot of 
territorial animals that they don't care if you're not presenting a threat. If you're nearby, the, uh, a grackle will come out of the tree and attack your head. <laughs> like well, they, they don't care. She, she had the anthropologist insight, though. I, I actually really liked her saying that she was using her anthropology because they, they haven't really like brought that up since the first episode. She's a xenoanthropologist. Right, and Book also got to do his empathic animal connection yeah. thing yeah. while you know they were doing that. I, I think plot wise, it like it's it's a solid plot point. Uh, it's just one of those things where, you know, I, I sometimes wish for an extra line or two of dialogue where she you know says something like, you know, I don't you know I, I've seen this kind of you know predator prey behavior. I think that it won't hurt me if I don't go any nearer to its eggs, and so I'm going to try something crazy. You know, like she just like says a little bit more to indicate where her what her knowledge is doing, uh, beyond just a oh animals protect their eggs because you know I get that we know that, um, but uh, you know I I still kind of I like this scene in in the sense that like I like the overall reveal of it that um, you know this was essentially a test of their humanity and stuff like that that's a very yeah. Star Trek thing. Yeah, and I, you know, I was saying I think a lot of the the treasure hunt story contrivances, you know, like having these trials you put people through that seem kind of ridiculous. I actually kind of approve of this one. It's like, okay, like this this trill was like, you know what? I'm just gonna stick around for hundreds of years and just see if I if I want to turn this over to the person or not. So, uh, I also I, I thought it was kind of cool to see the use of the Tricom badge when he's like, you know, and we eventually learned that the marking on the rock is a red herring. And I thought it was funny. Like, he's like, I don't even get what that means. Uh, but <laughs> just how Michael could like scan it and then pull up a display of it, like right in front of her, all with her com badge. Like the Tricom badges are so cool. And uh, the, the ha having the portable transporter is also cool. And I did kind of roll my eyes a little bit when they, they, they're beaming all over the place with their Tricom badges and portable mm -hmm. transporters, you know. But then when when the script needed them to not be able to beam, when they're like, mm -hmm. oh, no, we're standing between these two rocks and we can't beam. It's like, well, I think you could probably, like, squeeze out or something. Like, Why don't you just try again? You know, it worked, like, the last four or five times you tried it. But... <laughs> Uh, you, know, you, was... you have to have that to tell to tell any story. I know that they the, the Star Trek technology will always encounter a rock that will make it stop working when the writer needs it to. I think it was Joel in our maybe in, in just some Discord comments saying that something joking that it was good to see that uh, rocks screw up uh, transporters in the 32nd century just as much as yeah. they did uh, before. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the the writers need that. So the the Starfleet Academy writers are going to need that also. So good for them. Uh, I, I you know, thought it, well, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to mention that, uh, the, the thing I really liked, and this is this, the scene we've got pulled up uh, on the screen where they come back and, uh, uh, Dr. Colbert, AKA Janal is just chilling on some rocks and, and, and then he kind of like, well, we find out some more, a little bit more along the way too, about like how he was a part of a group of scientists hired by the Federation. We did find out some backstory on all that, but he asks them, is this like a time of peace? And, yeah. and they have to kind of try and answer honestly. Book is quick to say, to give like the answer that he wants, you know, like, like book, book, you can tell, like, doesn't really think about it that much. He's like, oh, this guy wants to hear. Yes. I'm just going to tell him yes. Without even thinking about the question. But Michael's he, more in, thoughtful. He's in courier mode. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, I got to get the job done. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Burnham w was a little bit more in Federation mode. And mm -hmm. she said, uh, it is a time of peace. That's true, but she's like, it's it may be tentative. Uh, what, what did she say? Something like it's not peace. It like, is it like a linear procedure or something like that? Yeah, that's. And and I was like, uh, yeah, I like I, I, I appreciate her honesty. Uh, uh, it reminded me a little bit of when Pike was at that uh, negotiation table and said, you know, you probably shouldn't take this deal <laughs> in that uh, Strange New Worlds episode when he was. I forget what he was even negotiating, but um, but yeah, he's like, you are probably going to try and you know the, the federation is probably going to try and exploit some t t this to some degree, and uh, I was like, yeah, uh, it's uh, it's he needed to hear the truth to believe he was helping the right people. When he was explaining the whole thing of like we found the tech and then we buried it and lied to everyone and, and hit it all. I rolled my eyes hard, but when he said, like, hey, it was the Dominion War. We didn't know who we could trust. We didn't know, like, what anyone would do with that technology. I was like, 
okay, that makes a shitload of sense that a federation, that is like the one time, and it makes sense for that to be just a, you know, a few years after that episode of The Chase. Because just a few years after that, this this intergalactic task force, they found the the progenitor tech, and it's the, the Dominion War is raging, and they don't, mm-hmm. you know, it makes a, a, a shitload of sense why you would not bring that back to the federation president you either a you don't trust the, the federation and what they might do with it b you trust the federation but you think section 31 might be might right. be in there or c you you trust the federation and don't even know about section 31 but you know that changelings do infiltrate starfleet sometimes so you don't want them to get their hands on the progenitor tech it's like you know what do you do like you know i don't care if you're really? if if you're like a some some you know power hungry romulan you you could still look at this technology would be like okay this is like a level of danger i don't want it to exist in the same universe as like my children and grandchildren i'm gonna i'm gonna help hide this it it really made a lot of sense yeah i think so too i i kind of wanted a little bit more data about like like i almost wish we had seen a side flash to to his past but they said it killed one of their Mm -hmm. their ally one of the scientists in the of the six and i was like oh you know like that sounded like it was some really pivotal moment or something for them. I was like, I kind of want to see that, you know, was it, was it really horrible? Was, you know, like, uh, was it just the violence of it that sort of galvanized, you know, how dangerous this could be? I mean, I hate to say it, but it's just one dude. Uh, <laughs> but, um, that said, um, yeah. Maybe so it was a really they, gruesome death that like traumatized them. I, I think it must be, um, uh, but yeah, they, uh, we, and so we know what they did. They took them, they tried to like clean themselves out of the databases and hide everything they'd done. And I guess they were like, we didn't find anything <laughs> to, but they must've, they must've gone off the grid because you, you know, that like, uh, the Federation was not just going to like something this vital and yeah. they just say, but they're, they're, these anything. guys were all really smart. You know, they got, you got to think they were like the brightest of the bright. So they, they'd yeah. be able to do it. Kind of like in The Martian when, like, the, the NASA astronauts are, like, hacking the – they don't like the orders they get from NASA, and they, they just, like, hack the computer on the space. It's like, okay, like, astronauts probably would be smart enough to do that, so sure. I'll, I'll sure. believe it. Yeah, a bunch of uh, uh, Richard Daystroms and all of those, yeah. Uh, I just want to know, like, are they going to the, like, locations of, like, where that guy died? Like, are, are, they, are they going to, like, the coordinates of where they found the technology and where I that think... colleague died? I think was, in the end, yes. I think that's so. the impression I, I get. But I just it, 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 the structure of the season suggests that it, they get there and it might actually just be like the the next one of these five map pieces they need. So you know, I think it's going to be the culmination. And you know, there's interesting. Like next episode, apparently there's some place they're going into that's politically unstable right. and is requiring like ambassadors to go and do some groundwork before they can just teleport in. Which when you've got a ship that can teleport anywhere, that's that's a, I, I appreciate that, you know, there, there's still some, sometimes there's some rocks that keep the transporter from working. In this case, it's the politics, yeah. which actually is more realistic than the rocks thing. Um, but yeah, I bet they, I, I think they are going to like maybe get to it bef- well before the season's end or, you know, if at least a few episodes before. And I just, it just doesn't gonna... make sense to me if, if this guy if they pass his test and he doesn't show them the coordinates of the progenitor technology, if he makes them go do yet another trial, that w- that will roll my eyes if they get there next week and it's like, oh, we got to do like another trial and this isn't just like the final destination of where we're supposed to go. Well, don't they have to do like, like, like I don't know, just on the sort of like uh, puzzle solving level, Burnham's got two of four pieces in that thing. Um, well, they have three now. This is the third one. Is this the third one? I thought we saw her put in the second one at the end of this episode. Um, yeah, Joel is saying in the comments. Oh yeah, yeah. Two more. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think they have. No, two that more. was the third. That's the yeah. That was the third one. Yeah. So two more. There's five total. Right. Uh, is that the deal? Uh, anyway, I think they've got a few more to go, but I'm betting they will get there. And it's just like, it's not one of these stories that just ends when you get to the arc. It's it's going to be something where, well. Right. Lock and Maul got there first and they've got it. Or it's not what we thought it would be, or somebody's already using applying it and now we have to stop it. You know, right. Like there's it, gonna it be just, some other beats. The, like the, the point I was trying to make was just if if he has the coordinates of the progenitor technology and that's not the that's not what he gave them, then like there there's there's no reason for him not to 
Not to just be well, like, oh, here, like I went here and my colleague died. Here's the location. You're, you're talking about that. You're talking about um, the the guy who this uh, the, this episode is titled for, right? Janal. Janal. Yeah. Like I I think that. Oh, well, I mean, I think that the thing that he and the other scientists set up was a, sis, a series of tests, essentially. Mm -hmm. And he did his part in his test, but I don't think he's like the last one. So, so like he, not... like he might not even whatever agreement they came up with this this conspiracy, this cabal. He like, wasn't supposed to give away the final place. Yeah, or yeah, maybe he doesn't even know it. Maybe it's like compartmentalized. Like he 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 maybe he couldn't. But right, maybe they selectively deleted some of their uh, memories okay. so that it's like the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've each got a piece of the puzzle. Um, well, we'll we'll see what happens, I guess. But uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I guess that, that I could I could work with that. That that makes me feel a little bit better uh, going into the next week's episode. Um, and, but I liked I liked uh, Janelle. I liked his uh, his concern about Colbert's safety, and uh, I liked uh, I liked Colbert being kind of gracious to have gotten to to do that experience. I agree with you, Dave. That Wilson Cruz. It was fun getting to see him uh, flex some some more acting muscles and get out of the typical Colbert wheelhouse. Did and you see what he said about that in the ready room fathery, who he patterned his character after or took inspiration from? Uh, Oh yeah. From, um, uh, uh the old guy in, in city slickers, Jack Palance and city slickers, yeah. a kind of one last ride, craggy voiced old timer. And I was like, once you see that and you go back and you look, it's like, it's all over it. Yeah, yeah. I have, by the way, I've never seen city slickers. I've seen bits and pieces though. I know, and I know what Jack Powell yeah, was like. on cable a lot in the early nineties. Yeah. It looked like, it looked like a good movie. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, 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 I do think, I do think he had a lot of fun with the role. Like you father, I'm a little, I'm not sure quite where the, this, the, the spiritual through line story is, is, is headed. He did. He said that his abuela, that she was a doctor, but she also kept religious icons and, kind of took a little bit of comfort in the idea that there's no, not everything has an answer, uh, you know, que sera, sera kind of thing. Um, and, and he said, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with that. And I do think like, I'm like, I, I said, I wanted to see a discovery this season. And I think whatever, we're going to see something with the progenitors. I don't know if it'll change the face of Star Trek. I honestly want it to be more, less about like this super Genesis technology, which was kind of how it was described by Kolber. Mm -hmm. And I want it to be more of a... Or by Stamets. Stamets, yeah, thank you. Um, and more of a, some philosophical thing about those, you know, the, the progenitors and why they did what they did and how, you know, some kind of connective woo-woo thing for everybody yeah. in the galaxy. Um, so... Um, but yeah, I don't want it to necessarily be like, we've proven the existence of God, you know, it's, uh, or we've disproven the existence of God, or is it really God if it's just super science? I, you know, like, I don't think that they can answer those ones satisfactorily. So I'm a little, I'm a little worried about where they, how, why they're setting up a, a, a storyline involving it, you know, where... That they want to find like some meaning in life. I definitely don't think you know. I'm, I'm not a person who subscribes to the idea that there's a meaning in life. I think we have to take what value we can create uh, in our interactions. Um, so, you know, I, I could end up philosophically opposed to what they what they do at, at the end. But uh, you know, um, I have some faith in the writers. Let's talk about the B story with Tilly and Rainer. So. It bothered me, like, at the beginning of the episode when Michael is like, uh, I'm going to need you to do some one-on-ones with the crew. It's like, I don't want to hear this corporate job jargon in my in my Star Trek. <laughs> but, uh, the the one-on-one -on -one meetings he does with the, the personnel. But, uh, yeah, we get to see uh, some of the some of the crew that we only have gotten introduced, like, this season, like uh, the uh, Bajoran uh, Asha or uh, Lieutenant Gallo. But uh, I, I liked the use of the bridge crew here. It didn't feel like they were being shoehorned in. You know, I complained a lot in season four when it's like, why do why do they you know shoehorn in these moments of just to give like the bridge crew s some some artificial uh, depiction of, of of relevance where, where where none none clearly exist when you have Bryce just talk about like oh you know it's kind of like surfing that's how we're gonna solve this problem and it's mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> it's like this what like. You know what the structure of this was like for anybody who's seen, say, Armageddon, 
when they do the psychological tests of the bunch of like crazy roughneck people and you get kind of pretty humorous answers of them. Or like in, in Discovery Season 3 when Disco gets to gets to Starfleet HQ for the first time and they do like the debrief with everyone. They kind of yeah. do the exact same version of this montage. It's a pretty montage, tried then. and true montage format. I think um, that's what Reno is referencing when she's like, last time they gave me chips when I did oh, this. Oh, I didn't think about that. Uh, that's that's a good point. Um, but I'm, did, Sarians are asexual. That's kind of cool to know, right? Um, did, did he say asexual? I know that they reproduce asexually. I yeah. guess um, that's true. I, so they 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 are not necessarily asexual in lifestyle. That's just not yeah, part I of their they, reproduction. They just don't have to have a mate yeah. to bear eggs. I don't know if they just happens when it happens or. Did Linus abandon them. those children when he came to the thirty second century with Michael Burnham? Did it, are, are, are these are these eggs that he's <laughs> he's hatched since being in the thirty second century? I assumed that they were from the they were yeah that, those were twenty third twenty twenty fourth twenty third. century. So all of his all of his kids died hundreds of years ago without him. Yeah, well, we haven't seen. He's probably been talking to Dr. Colbert about that. Or, but they don't they don't raise them as parents. You're you're raised by the community, right, so community. it actually wouldn't be that big of a deal. Yeah, he may he may be, have like uh, had mm-hmm. a like uh, a good time reading about their exploits and adventures and their their own progeny and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, yeah. The, the the chat is 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 commenting on that now. That yeah, that, that that's actually quite normal for, for Saurians. So. Um, I, I am happy we finally got an explanation for that Tribble that's roaming around the ship. It's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, that, that I guess, is Lieutenant Christopher's Tribble now. That uh, that he inherited from Nilsson, who is played by the woman who used to play Arium in Season 1. But then they recast Arium to kill Arium in Season 2, and they let that actor play Nilsson. And then, right. I guess, but she's out of it for Season 5, so Christopher inherited the Tribble and... There you go. So, you know, uh, I, I know people are, like, dying to get, like, Zora and Kraft explained, and they want they want to know what's going on in the Short Treks Calypso. But I'm okay with that never being mentioned. I can just I can just uh, tell myself, oh, that was Zora's dream. The real mystery I needed answered before the end of Discovery was, why is there a Tribble uh, <laughs> randomly seen on the ship? Uh, so it's, now it's we know. Christopher's uh, Tribble. Unless that's a different, unrelated Tribble. <laughs> Um, but so the heart of that scene, I, I did think it was interesting. I thought it was like almost a little too comical in, in a way. And I was like, oh, uh, you know, I didn't think it, it, it's making Rainer look really bad to me. And then he did reveal that there was a method to his madness. And like, I don't think it's a good method, but, but that he was like finding out things about them by like whatever they put forward kind of little, and he was doing a little Sherlock Holmesy yeah. type uh, cold read on people where he's like, oh, well, if, you know, because he mentioned this, family is very important to Linus, and, th- you know, this isn't, you know... Uh... He was jumping to conclusions, like a lot of older people tend to do, because they have, like, <laughs> yeah. a lot of experience and tend to have, like, pretty good judgment, but they, because of that, they they, they assume that they know everything, and then they, they, they become a little bit more intellectual lazy, and they stop thinking about things, you just kind of look at the surface. Yeah. I, I've seen that behavior. And then, uh, and then along comes uh, Tilly the Millennial to uh, to say, uh, uh, "I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna completely put up with this, and uh, I'm even gonna speak out of turn." Uh, which you're on a new ship, fresh off a demotion, trying to hide how hard that is by being a giant, and she ran out of words. <laughs> I thought that was some nice scripting there. Yeah. That's, that's good stuff. Um, uh, it, it's funny. This this does. It reminded me of the, you know, I, I think he most compares with, even he's a different guy, but he most compares with, um, oh my God, uh, Jellico, um, uh, when, who Riker said that, you know, like, there's no joy when we work under, you know, <laughs> I work under you. And I, I, back then I groaned like in the eighties or early nineties at that, because I was like, oh my God, dude, you're on like a at least quasi military ship, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, toughen up. How are you going to how are you going to tell your boss that? There's no joy yeah. working under you, sir. Yeah, I mean, and I guess this shows maybe how far uh discovery or you know, how far the the future Starfleet has has changed things. Um although obviously the burn built, you know, built him. He was, you know, like a child as if he were a yeah. child of World War 2. Like well, it works boomers. out so well for the show. It, like it actually makes sense for him to have uh, an outdated perspective in the setting they've created. Right? 
Uh, yeah, I, th I think it's pretty good stuff uh, when, when they got around to it. And I thought it was interesting that the episode ended kind of, not ambiguously, but without a... Th th that had not been resolved. He wasn't like... He, I th he was able to, I think, see where he had kind of missed the boat. Uh, Tilly at least knew where he stood, even though she was not swayed by it. And... Uh, you know, he had not learned his lesson necessarily. Although I think he's probably will incorporate it. But do you, do you have any predictions, Father, as to where this character is going to go? Do you think he's just going to become uh, more chill? Or or is he going to be struggling more? I've been told that Callum Keith Rennie is, is going around saying, if there was a season six, I would have been, I would have been a regular in season six. Oh, so it, it sounds like the arc was for him just to become like the XO of... of the discovery so i don't know if that will still happen or if maybe the the things that they added in the ending maybe they add a death and that's like his big discovery at the end of his journey you know they talk about they talk about you know the, the journey you're on and the connections you make along the way maybe the thing that he learns is that like oh you actually do need to have these connections and these these friendships and, the, and this more intimate relationship with your crew and maybe like he learns that and then dies i don't want him to die though if anything i know last week i was trying to recruit david ajala onto the starfleet academy show yeah. uh, but i i think oh my god what a great opportunity for this character you know a, uh, a an academy show that has as one of the professors on the on the academy grounds is is you have the the gruff old Captain Rainer, and you talk about like kids talking about like right. oh Captain Rainer's class, like you know how I, I think it would be it. like it would be like Kirk, it'd be like you you sink or you think in Lieutenant Kirk's class. I think it would be like that with Rainer. You know, I hadn't thought about it, but they're they have already put together he and Tilly. Yeah, they're already they're already bouncing off of each other, and I if they find out they work well together, uh, you might be onto something there. That's interesting. And I think that would just be cool for the character. I think that would be like a cool uh, arc to, to put him on that like, okay, you don't get to be like the, the proactive guy, uh, you know, out on the ship making the calls and everything. You're, you're, you're from an outdated era, but you still have a lot of wisdom and perspective and knowledge. So why don't you, you know, stay on the ground and teach these kids. And if, you know, if you see stuff out in the stars that, that you, you think, you know, it, it's it's not right or it needs to be corrected then like you teach those kids how to correct it and and you you continue to contribute through them i think that would be I'll that would say, be a good a, a good arc for I, I would very much like him now that you have mentioned this um and i i have wonder if the, the fact that they made him a relatively simple makeup job mainly ears uh, that would also make the, you know that that's that's kind of a clever idea for something so that each week you don't have to go and do the full saru um <laughs> but um the i will say this on a sort of realistic level to be a captain you have to have i think a certain amount of ego and it's hard for me to imagine him you know like really being comfortable at, with the xo position uh or doing the maybe even doing the teaching thing although i could see him learning that side but I feel like his ego has to is going to have to bristle at becoming first officer, um, and and you know doing what he sees as menial tasks when he's like I need to hunt down and track lock and maul. <laughs> um, so, but I'm liking I always like his presence, and I'm looking forward to seeing future episodes with him. Well, before we talk about the the end of the episode, let's talk about the. Saru and Tarina C story. Uh, if last week was the final Saru mission on the Discovery, I guess this was the the first week of seeing Ambassador Saru and what his life as a diplomat is like post his Starfleet career. I don't know. Maybe maybe we'll get him back in that Starfleet uniform someday. But uh, Dave, what do you think about him and Tarina, the more domestic well, before lifestyle? Before we get to that, I want to say I like seeing him being a pretty pretty sly, pretty clever uh ambassadorial operator he's um uh he 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 brokered a situation um to the satisfaction of of everybody involved that could have fallen apart and so i liked seeing that he was already effective in his role he just found out through um her assistant that there was going to be there's going to be complications from it and he hadn't you know necessarily thought that far ahead um, I liked this. I, I think this is a, you know, reflects, you know, a not uncommon experience of, 
uh, you know, uh, one person being overly protective of another when that person is really pretty capable. And the, the more important thing is to kind of stand by, support, and, and, and present a kind of united front. I really like this sort of sweet scenes in there. His embarrassment at being called handsome in the invitation. Uh, what do they say? Handsome and something else. Um, astute or something like that. Uh, um, but... it, w- it was a, a word that I, I never say. Uh, handsome and Ari- erinodite? Er- er- erinodite, yeah, yeah. How, Just... I, don't, I don't even know how to say it. I, I think it means like like educated. Yeah, it's. I don't even know what it means. Like, I don't know what it means. I don't no, know how to say it. So I'm clearly not what it is. But you, no, you know, it's you're fine. You're exactly right. It's it's just like a learned learned person is erudite, or if you're if you're a, a good oh. speaker and you're a clear. That's speaker. That's a good way of describing. How many languages does he speak? You know, he went to the academy and learned like uh, half of the human languages. It's like yeah, he's he's a he's a bit of a academic. You know, he is. He is. Um, I, did they ever say – I wasn't sure if he got comfortable enough to – I thought he was going to say, by the way, you can put that back in. But that never came up again. And I was like, did they cut it or not? I want them to put it back in. The the line from the no. – the... That he was they, that he was unsure about. Yeah, uh, Tarina tells Duvin towards the end, like, uh, "There's going to be one minor uh, edit on the on the announcement, but uh, right, th- but it, it will go out as planned." Uh, I, I like to see, I like seeing Saru do his thing though, and they kind of explain, I guess, what his what his role is like, like an ambassador of multiple planets, or he's just kind of. I mean, they they do they do like the TV version where it doesn't like go into like the detail. But it's like, oh, well, you wanted a star base, but maybe we can just, like, increase patrols instead. Are, are you okay with that? I mean, we got to run it by the president. Uh, but are, are all the people that he's, like, leading the meeting of, are they all, like, a president of a planet? And, like, you know, Tarina is there as, like, president of Navarre. Like, everyone else is a president. And then he's, like, the ambassador that represents all their worlds. I, I assume it's something yeah, I think similar he, to that. Yeah, I think know that he represents, like, a coalition of smaller worlds. So it's probably something like that. It was definitely meant to be kind of one of those more, like, slightly symbolic of the job meetings not like a real you know this was not a deep dive into parliamentary procedures this was a hey it's him doing some ambassador kind of stuff um and and so uh but yeah i I think that's that's reasonable to assume i really liked doug jones's acting and the improved prosthetics where he has more expressive face acting in season five. I, I really see it in the Torino scenes. Uh, I make am sad that they didn't figure it out before season five, but it kind of makes sense that it's like, oh, Torina is what is making Saru more in touch with his emotions and making him more expressive. It, all, it almost is, was kind of a happy accident that it worked out how it did, I guess, now that, I, now that I'm talking about it. But, you know, it was uh, interesting, Father, it was like, when he felt he'd overstepped his bounds, a little bit of the old Saru timidity yeah. came back. And then she assured him, it's in the past. Where, where you know, this is kind of. She's a sort of practical person too, and she's like, we're gonna, we're gonna occasionally bristle against each other, and then we're gonna move on. Yeah, and I like, I like the uh, amount of grace and patience that she had with Saru. Yeah, yeah, they are, they are, uh, you know, the sort of mature couples goals. I, uh, I feel like I need to see them being silly or something like that. They, I want to see them uh, like I, I want. They need to see the scene where they're in bed together, and you know they're just <laughs> they're just close, and like it's a postcoital sequence, and they're just kind of giggly and having fun, smoking cigarettes, smoking cigarettes. They could be high. They could be. They could. They're smoking. Could some, smoking some. Smoking snake leaf. Some Vulcan stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, you know the Vulcans got unwind. They they're, they they put so much into the logic thing. But anyway. Uh, I think yeah, we'll see no. them kiss at the wedding. I think I think the the last episode they'll have a big wedding and and we'll see the we'll see Father, the big kiss then. I don't know if you remember, but I was I was not particularly sold on them before. I think last yeah. season I was like they're fine, it's okay. I, I'm liking it more now. I still kind of wish I think I kind of wish Saru had been in a, like a somewhat more passionate relationship. But as it's proceeding along, I'm liking it more and more. I like how they're handling it. I like the actress who plays Tarina. And, and and it's 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 like such an unusual one, you know. We usually don't get to see kind of this uh, a quieter, more uh, intellectual courtship. To yeah, you know, yeah, it's that, a bit unique. 
Yeah, so it ends up being pretty cool. We uh, see a lot of characters like this, so it's fun to see uh, a, a flirtation and a courtship, and then you know, full on uh, relationship and, and marriage. I think it's it's been fun. Yeah, I agree. And um, you know, knowing that this is kind of the last hurrah for Doug Jones, it's the last season of Discovery. It's adding a certain amount of weight, and and and, and like I'm investing more emotion and extra emotion, and I like oh, I need them to be happy. I need them to be happy. Um, so I really hope, I really hope it plays out well. Well, the episode ends with Michael and Colbert talking about, uh, you know, seeking answers and, uh, the, the, the origins of the universe and life and all that stuff. But, it, uh, and in the, in the Trill Caves, as, as Gray gives a, a speech about the, the journey of life and the connections we form, we see Maul infiltrate the guardians and plant a uh, a bug a tracking device i assume on a yeah, tracking device is what i would guess but who knows so maul and lock maybe it's a bomb <laughs> just gonna blow the enterprise to pre- blow the discovery to pieces the discovery you're like a pack led in lower decks you you want to call every ship and every show it's the enterprise it's like <laughs> shut up whenever the cerrito shows up they're like look it's the enterprise it is the enterprise they're all the same they, they have the same look and every 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 woman captain they call Janeway. It's all the Star uh, Trek Enterprise. <laughs> but yeah, so it's a safe assumption. Uh, we're getting to some uh, Zenkethi space next week, and Maul and Locke are gonna follow the ship there. I'm I'm hoping we get more Maul and Locke next week though, because all we got was uh, one close up of Maul. I got we got well no I take that back. The episode opens with a bit of backstory. We get like a, a three or four lines of exposition. And then it ends with a, a close-up of her. So it's kind of bookended on Maul. Uh, Locke is, uh, is nowhere to be seen. But uh, how, how do you feel about that? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a trope to show somebody who you don't know is like a, uh, one of the bad guys. And they're walking by and then they do something that reveals themselves. And it's a trope I like. <laughs> I was like, oh, she, she's cool. Uh, like, she's sly. You must have worked pretty hard to get inside these super secret caves on Trill. And so... I uh, I I liked it as a as a good little cliffhanger. I was hoping that we would learn more about them this episode. Uh, you know, we, but one of my fears, I guess, is if if they uh, draw out the mysteries on Wall and Locke, it's like we're also relieved that you know that they don't have like the the mystery box mystery going on of what's the the larger arc about, what's the larger story about, what what are, what are these characters searching for? Uh, but I guess I I guess I'm now instead worried about the Maul and Locke stuff getting drawn out. But I, I'm having fun speculating. Uh, they mentioned I the brain. I don't mind it being drawn out. Uh, you know, I, like, I, I'm not in a super hurry to see yeah, them so You, you kind of, like, write yourself into a corner when you if you start, like, uh, making the mystery a big deal. You start having, like, the characters be like, well, what do we actually know about this guy? And stuff. And then, like, it turns out to be something kind of lame. Um, right. It, it can be disappointing. And Discovery's done that to us before. Father, were you about to mention? I, I I have become aware of this this theory. This, this something about the brain. Well, they keep mentioning the brain. This is the third episode in a row they've brought up the brain. So yeah. I I think if nothing else, the brain are set up to be the. I keep talking about the Academy show. I need to talk about Discovery, and not Academy. But are they setting the brain up to be the Klingons of Starfleet Academy? I think that's likely. You know, I I'm, I keep wondering who's who are the the threats now without the Emerald Chain. So I I liked them mentioning the the Tholians and the Breen and then the Orions again last week. With the Breen come up the most, and we know that Locke does not like wearing a helmet. We know that no one knows what he is, and the Breens are supposed to be mysteries. So maybe he's just a, an unmasked Breen. I that that's the theory I have heard. I, I don't know if I've heard any more details about like how it would all what what the idea is, but I think that's an interesting one, and that would be um, like like the Breen could use some fleshing out. They you know they were just a scary force, um, so uh, I'd I'd be down for. I'm at least open to the idea for sure. You know, hopefully they they've got a good story to tell with it. It's also possible that he's a, a Zen Kethi, I guess. What's what's that? Well, that's the uh, that's the species that they're going to uh, next week. But I'll ah uh, uh, okay. I got something fun for that in the in the in the Gorn eggs, I guess. But okay. uh, we we don't know anything about them in canon. We don't know what they look like either. But I guess um, the people the people in Starfleet would know. Like they wouldn't be like, oh, we have no idea what Locke is. So yeah, I guess he's not a Zinkethi. But yeah, that's true. Uh, what what where have we seen them before though? Uh, Deep Space Nine, they're mentioned, but not uh, 
scene, but th- there was a war with them. They 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 were a big, powerful, scary race to go up against because they were so terrified of the Dominion going there. Uh, I'm sorry, they were so terrified of the Defiant going there and starting a war when that changeling on the Defiant took over and was mm-hmm. he was going to like basically like drive the Defiant to Zenkethi's space and start fighting them and start right, a war right. between the Federation and the Z- another war between the Federation and Zenkethi because there was one like shortly before uh, Next Generation in DS9 the Federation was at war with the Cardassians they were at war with the Zenkethi so I like to think it's like the same war and you also throw in the people from Suddenly Human uh, but we've never seen one so yeah they've got some options and I imagine that they wanted to have a few options on the table so that nobody was just like ah I'm 100% sure of my theory and and I, you know that's that's good in a show like this you do need to have some ambiguity at times because people will be theorizing about everything so I, I think well, that actually is important to do speaking of that one last theory and then this is this is all I got to say before the gorn eggs but I was thinking last week that there might be a moment when book has his his moment of temptation uh, uh-huh. What Stamets is saying now about, like, oh, the progenitor tech could possibly be used to reanimate the dead. Mm-hmm. I think at some point, uh, Book is going to be offered, like, hey, you come help Maul and Locke get the progenitor tech, and we can bring back Quajon. We can bring back Leto. We can br- bring back your family. And you're going to have to see Book make that choice. Is he, going to, is he going to betray Michael again, or is he going to stay on her side? I think, we're, I think he's going to be tested. Uh, I think that's a that's that's a good notion, uh, Fathery. I, I had I laughed for a minute just imagining he goes off with them, and it's like an exact recreation of the previous season with Burnham like stop it, book, and he's like he's like I don't want another Quajon, and uh, <laughs> it's just they just recreate it almost exactly. But no, there's 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 obviously a serious trauma to yeah. be. I th- I think from it's that. it's going to be their excuse of like why he doesn't have to do community service anymore. It's going to be like, see, look how clearly reformed he is. He had the opportunity to do the same thing again, and he rejected it. So, yeah, uh, I think that that makes some sense. Also, by the way, we know what they should do with the progenitors tech. They should uh, hand it off to uh, other dimensional Tarka and his boyfriend in the universe <laughs> that they now inhabit. Yeah, I don't think Tarka made it over there. I think no. I think th- then hand it off to the other. I think guy. that dude is fried, but. The other guy might have had uh, less sort of dangerous ideas floating around in his head about uh, rekindling things. <laughs> we'll see what happens with progenitor tech, but uh, I am a little it, worried. I'll say this: there's there's a little fear of the usual discovery thing of like the burn ending or kind of dissatisfying elements of control and the red angel. Uh, that you know, yes, we we do know broadly what they're looking for, but like when they get there. It's the kind of thing that Discovery has been known to drop the ball on. So, fingers crossed for you, Discovery. Yeah, I think they actually stuck the landing pretty good with season four. So I'm, I'm pretty I can agree confident. I can agree with that. They've they they also have it within them to stick the. Landing. I'll say this: I I'm really liking the season three episodes in, but I was also this impressed three episodes into Picard season two. Right. So, and you, you, you weren't, you, you didn't fall for Picard season two, like I did early on. So, um, but I don't know. Discovery season five seems to be working on both of us. So I think it might uh, know what it's doing. Yeah. We'll find and out. I also like, I'm, I'm a little bit aware that I'm a little, uh, sentimental about discovery at this point. And so, uh, I, you know, like huh? if this had been season, season five, but like, I knew there were going to be two more. Could be that I might come down a little harsher on some of it. But. It makes it special that like what we got with Doug Jones last week, what we got with Wilson Cruz this week, it really does make it more special. Yeah, yeah, I'm liking. I'm really. If people aren't watching um, the Ready Room, uh, recommend it. There, there's all kinds of good stuff coming out um, uh, in these conversations, and actors are kind of, in a lot of ways, doing farewells and reminiscing about some of the, you know, some of the really amazing times. Doug Jones is talking about being excited about um, taking those uh, those leg extender hoof things off, <laughs> but but like there's it's really sweet. There's actually like a lot of great great stuff in every episode of Ready Room. So, well, uh, let's move on to the Gorn Egg section of the show. This is where I like to talk about the Easter eggs, in jokes, and continuity connections that we thought were worth mentioning. Uh, but the uh, episode opens with the reveal of a USS. Lockerer, uh, I can assume that was named after J.P. Lockerer, the camera operator who passed away, worked on the show in previous seasons. 
Uh, also in the Federation member meeting, we see what appears to be a Soleil. Oh. Uh, this <laughs> image is actually from uh, Trek Core or Trek Movie. I grabbed it from one of them. Uh, but the, the Soleil were uh, a reptilian species introduced in the Next Generation episode, Lonely Among Us. And I really like the uh, the modern ver- – it's still kind of the, the same cobra head except uh, red instead of green. But kind, it kind of the cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, kind of just kind of a, an improved uh, version of, of the, the old uh, shape. You know, I guess the, uh, the face looks a, a bit more uh, snake-like. But yeah, I, I, I like, like it, it a lot. Yeah, I, cool. I like it uh, much more than the uh, – and I love Strange New Worlds, but I like the Disco Soleil much more than the Strange New Worlds Gorn. Um, I, I agree with that. Uh, next up, I liked this one. This was a fun deep cut. Tarina's shrewd political operator assistant, Duvin, uh, said, uh, that, uh, making that announcement would be, uh, at, the, at that current time would be like adding a spark to a keg of cabrodine. Carb- did I say that? C- Cabrodyne? That was the Maybe. substance used in the explosives and the bombs in Keiko's school in uh, in the Hand of the Prophets when Holy they shit. the Bajorans were bombing her school for for teaching uh, a, a cosmology and not like intelligent design. Right. <laughs> She's like teaching evolution. Right, um, and they like the Bajoran fundamentalists yeah. bombed her. So I'm I'm glad to know that that's that stuff that the cabradine still around in the 32nd century. Um, I, I also really loved Dr. Pollard's uh, response to Captain Rayner during her one-on-one when she said, the worst thing I've ever seen in the sick bay was a binar with a decalin boar worm eating its synaptic processor. Uh, we know the binar from the TNG episode 101101, whatever it has, like ones and zeros in it. Yeah. But that that planet, the dark column boar worm, the... Dark Kala was the rogue planet from the Enterprise episode Rogue Planet, where those hunters were hunting the slugs that Archer kissed one of them when it turned into a, a yep, woman. Yep, very so, dark planet out there. Yeah, yeah. so that's uh, uh, interesting. Um, also, Saru uses the saying, to rush a Salot is to risk a Goring. That was a fun uh, animated series reference to the uh, to the. Have, have we lot. ever seen a live action depiction of a Saylot? Um, you haven't seen it yet, but when we get to Enterprise season four, nice. um, I mean live action, it's CGI, but sure, yeah. but yeah, you're, you're, that's that's what I meant too. <laughs> but CG. it's like, but it's on screen next to Scott Bakula and yeah, Julian right Blaylock, so that sounds dope. We got some Sluggo Cola. I think they just reused the prop that they made for uh, Picard season three. Someone, uh, someone shipped it up from LA to Toronto to get it on Discovery. But Sluggo Cola also makes survives the thirty second century. And I guess that uh, Ferengi at the the bar in Discovery is named Red. They call that bar Reds. So I guess it has a name. And we uh, get those coordinates to uh, from from Janal and learn that they are in Zenkethi space. So that's why the Federation has to send in ambassadors because the Zenkethi, I guess, still have some some rough relations with the Federation. But yeah, those were people that, like Cisco said, like war with them was like really terrible. And I, I hope we never have to go to war with them again. I, I'm excited about next week's episode uh, taking place in their space. I hope we learn about the Zenkethi. I don't know uh, what, the, what they'll show us. If we'll see one, or if we'll learn anything about them, but I'm hoping that there's something we, we get some Zenkethi lore. I've been, I've been wanting to learn about them for like 25 years, so I'm ready. The day has come. Well, that's all I got on Gorn Eggs. Uh, I'd be curious what people think about this episode, though. Y'all heard Dave and I talk about it for an hour and a half, so folks should comment on YouTube, or you can uh, reply to my tweets. I put out tweets asking people for their opinions on new episodes each week, or you can join the Text Trek Discord server and talk to us there, and we might share your responses next week. Uh, Dave has some subspace transmissions we received from last week's two-episode premiere. So, uh, Dave, what are people saying about Red Directive and Under the Twin Moons? Yeah, yeah. People responding to those first two episodes. First, we got... uh... From Facebook, Tom Casey uh, says, For what it's worth, I thought the first two episodes were bang-up job. Very well done. Going to miss this show, but uh, I know it's got its haters, but it was okay for me. It got me to go to Vegas 
And uh, notes, it'll be weird this year meeting actors this time around. Little little farewells to some of them. Or at least short-term farewells. Um, from Blue Sky, uh, let's see, uh, Trek Wars uh, says, Loved it. Loved the direction. Uh, this gives me the feeling of The Force Awakens in the best way possible. The pacing is extraordinary, and it is fun, fluffy Trek with the deep emotional core. Uh, does note way better than like the disastrous season that was season two. <laughs> um, oh, by the way, uh, Trek Wars is a uh, podcast that compares like a Star Trek and Star Wars. They're like watching all of it in release order, and they're also based in Austin, Texas. Oh, so that's shout like out their to specific them. thing. Okay, yeah. that's very cool. Uh, I'm going to throw out a few from uh, from YouTube uh, opinions no one cares about. Will frequently kind of live stream some thoughts and i thought had a few fun ones from there uh so let's see so here's a few um uh, an alien who rose to captain in starfleet and then becomes an ambassador saru's taking the spot career path i see he's even in love with a vulcan mm. um let's see uh also says the question is which episode will rainer have his sympathetic dipshit from chicago backstory moment four i'm going with four so we'll we'll find out in uh, in about a week um, nice. Uh, I thought this was an interesting one. Uh, Rainer said he was involved in seven red directives and was uh, on point or uh, uh, point on four of them. How often are they a thing? Because yeah, that's uh, apparently these like kill uh, don't, kill don't stun directives were common enough. Now he's got to have a career stretching decades. Um, and 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 it was it was in the era of the post burn pre pre disco. So. I guess things have been pretty rough, but apparently that's common enough. Um, uh, and then here's here's just a more general thought. Uh, I'm a little apprehensive that they seem to be taking the chase and trying to stretch the plot across an entire season. And that, will, you know, we'll just have to kind of wait and see on, I think. Um, but eh, reasonable fear. Um, last one I've got is from Discord. Uh, Joel... Uh, frequent poster Joel uh, also was kind of live posting uh, responses and said uh, talking about the clue that they got from the uh, what was it the stone that had the, the uh, Romulan five line poetry mm -hmm. says the clue is like the staff of Ra from Raiders Maul and Locke have uh, only have the front piece and are digging in the wrong place which we did talk about last week a little bit but yeah that's it. That's our subspace transmissions. Thanks to everybody. I look forward to seeing some more next yeah. week. Yeah, yeah, and people should uh, should chime in if you have thoughts on Janal. Like I said, and we we might work it into the show next week uh, when we talk about season five, episode four, "Face the Strange." I'm going to end the show with Michelle Paradise's tease. She gave us a little tease for every episode in the final season. On episode four, she says mind bending and exciting and a heck of a lot of fun so mind bending and exciting i think is, is zen kathy's space is there like some weird trippy mind bending stuff going on in their space i think i think it might get weird the episode is called face the strange so i think we're gonna have some weird trippy stuff father do you happen to have handy what the description was for this week's episode for the, uh, uh she said dr colbert as you've never seen him before Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was a nice, nice bit of understatement. I'm, I'm enjoying these, Father. I'm glad you're doing her little, her little hints and yeah, these uh, are fun. Teases. So who knows? Maybe we'll get Michelle on the show someday. She, she doesn't do any podcasts. I've never seen her in like in That'd interviews. So but cool. I, I, we're gonna, we're gonna get. I have so many questions for her. No one talks about her. I feel like I'm the only one with questions for her. So Michelle, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find you. I'm trying to get a hold of you. So. Uh, we'll work on that. But uh, looking forward to episode four next week. Uh, please uh, watch the first reaction streams with Rachel on Thursdays. Dave and I will be back Friday with the deep dive discussion. Listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. And until next time, as always, live long and prosper, y'all. Listen to the Text Trek podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or at text-trek.com. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash text-trek. And follow Fathery on Twitter at txtrek. Please support us by liking our videos and subscribing to our channel on YouTube. Thank you and take care.